Donald Rozier, better known as Buck Dharma, is the guitarist and one of the two original members from the classic lineup of Blue Oyster Cult. Of course, Eric Bloom is the other one. But they were there for Godzilla, Burning For You, Don't Fear the Reaper, and all that other stuff. But getting a stage name always has an interesting story. We were hoping we'd get one from Buck Dharma, how we got that name on Rock History Music. Blue Oyster Cult a pioneering American rock band was formed in 1967 in Stony Brook, New York. Their initial name was Soft White Underbelly, and their classic lineup included Donald Buck Dharma Rozier on lead guitar and vocals, Albert Bouchard on drums and vocals, Alan Lanier on keyboards and rhythm guitar, Eric Bloom on lead vocals and guitar, and Joe Bouchard was the bass player and a vocalist. Their lineup included so many genre bends, Heavy metal, psychedelic, progressive rock, and in the beginning garnered a real good cult following in the New York area. But they soon caught the attention of manager Sandy Perlman. He helped them secure a deal with Columbia Records and their self-titled debut album was released in 1972, showcasing their electric style and darkly poetic lyrics, laying down the groundwork for their future success. Even non-Blue Oyster cult fans would know the album Agents of Fortune which of course featured the iconic lineup. It was the band's fourth studio album, released in 1976, and it was a major turning point in their career. This was the time where the band embraced a more polished and accessible sound, blending hard rock and pop sensibilities. Agents of Fortune became a huge commercial success, largely due to that song, which would later be known as the Cowbell Song, which we'll get into in a second, that would be featured on Saturday Night Live, giving it a whole new life. Don't Fear the Reaper. Written by Buck Dharma, the song has a haunting melody and existential lyrics. It captured the imagination of a large audience. Don't Fear the Reaper reached number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100 and remains a staple on classic rock radio. Another was Godzilla, released in 1977 from Spectres. Godzilla is sort of a tongue-in-cheek tribute to the famous Japanese monster. It, again, was written by Buck Dharma, and the song features one of those like real driving riffs, powerful lyrics, describing the creature's destructive rampage. It became a fan favorite, and it's known for its powerful guitar solo. It's also really catchy. Burning For You from 1981 and Fire of Unknown Origin, another huge song for the band. It was co-written by Buck Dharma and Richard Meltzer. And this song is what this band does really well when they want to get a bit more commercial giving it a melodic rock approach and introspective lyrics. The track became a top 40 hit, reaching number 40 on the Hot 100, and was bolstered by a heavy rotation on MTV. Overall, Blue Oyster Cult's legacy is firm in the rock and roll history books, combining some great pop at times, a lot of rock, and metal genres. The band was always well known for complex arrangements fantastic lyrics, and a willingness to experiment, that's what set them apart from their contemporaries. Now the resurgence of Blue Oyster Cult's song, Don't Fear the Reaper. It was significantly influenced by a sketch on Saturday Night Live that aired on April 8th, 2000. The sketch was known as More Cowbell, and it became an iconic moment in pop culture, revitalizing interest in that one song and the band. In the sketch, actor Christopher Walken plays a music producer, Bruce Dickinson, and he's overseeing the recording of the song, Don't Fear the Reaper. Will Ferrell portrays Gene Frankel, a fictional cowbell player who's very enthusiastic about playing excessive cowbell, which becomes the focal point of the whole skit. Now, despite the band's attempts to focus on the overall recording of the song, Walken's character insists that the track needs more cowbell. Walken delivers that now iconic famous line, guess what? I got a fever, and the only prescription is more cowbell. Now the humor of court and the absurdity of the skit really struck a chord with fans, and it's become one of the most famous Saturday Night Live skits of all time. And that's when Don't Fear the Reaper had a resurgence. People wanted to hear it. And now it's ingrained in pop culture for a whole other reason. Where did Buck Dharma come from? Back in the in the early days, we considered pseudonyms, and I'm, I'm the only fellow that liked a pseudonym, so... I like being Buck Dharma. I like having uh, an alter ego, you know. But it's uh, it served me well. Do you have a take on the Guess Who Burton Cummings thing? Um, you know, it's it's you know that that band is a powerhouse of creativity, you know, and you know, and whether or not they ever 
uh, work together as far as Burton and uh, and uh, you know Bachman. You know I, that could happen, I suppose. You know, but if you know if it doesn't, it's okay. And if it does, that's to the good. I kick out the jams. Um, that is like the song that everyone knows, but it's close to your guys' heart, uh, of course. Yeah, you know we we admired the MC5 at the time, and to have that song come out now, I think is is just I'm you know I'm quite proud of it. You know, it sounds great to me. I think it does the band and their their memory proud, and and you know to people that haven't heard it or even or even be up on the MC5. You know, that's you know here, listen to this, fellas. You know, fellas and gals, check this out. You know. When you left home, when you said, that's it, mom and dad, I'm taking my pots and pans, I'm leaving. When you left home, that young man, what was yeah. in that young man's record collection? Um, At that point, you know, I didn't have any records because I was sort of on my own. I didn't take a lot of stuff, but I had come from uh, surf music as a high schooler. Uh, yeah, you know, I didn't really even start listening to words and music until I had met uh, Sandy Perlman and and you know had what I perceived as the opportunity to be a recording artist. You know, it had never occurred to me myself until I met Sandy that you could do that. So, um, so I came out of instrumental music. Uh, I was always a uh, I listened to pop radio and and. Uh, and and rock and roll radio and then you know the blues when the english artists started covering the american blues artists you know then you go back to the source so that was that and uh the psychedelic bands coming out of san francisco in the mid 60s that was uh that was a big influence on on me and us you know so so we were you know if like Every every groundbreaking record, you know, the Cream, you know, Jimi Hendrix, you know, the Doors, the you know, the Grateful Dead, you know, all these bands that were coming out, you know, were were really influential to uh, where we were, you know, the Soft Road Underbelly, which preceded the Blue Oyster Cult, you know, we we thought of ourselves as a psychedelic band, you know, an East Coast psychedelic band. Outside of music, what are you best at? As a commentator, probably. <laughs> I've got an opinion about stuff, but well, you got the voice uh, for it. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> when and at the time, I thought if if BOC, you know, failed or stopped selling records or something, I I wanted to go into the recording aspect of it because that's always you know intrigued me, and uh, so I would I would have tried to be a record producer, you know, when record production was a was a thing you know that i could grasp you know the producers today that you know i wouldn't wouldn't know how to create a commercially viable sound in 2024 i have no idea how to do it you know i just know what i know by the way 1976 what happened to you guys in 76 and you guys had success before but i mean this was like how does that change how did that change you uh, with agents of fortune, how, how how did that change the band? What what? Mm, well, there was sort of well, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, the guys when I joined the band, they were pretty stubborn about their aesthetic. That they didn't want to do cheap pop music. They always wanted to do something that was a little, you know. Why is that? You know. <laughs> I've never heard it it's said saying, that way before. Why is that? Well, it's just because we like it, you know. And we were, you know. But you do get pressure when something explodes like Don't Fear the Reaper, you know. And Donald said, I'm not going to I'm not gonna write Reaper Part 2, you know. <laughs> Put that out, you know. So, but there was, there was definitely pressure that, you know, I mean, I don't think, I mean, we, we did do some sort of commercial type records, but um, but uh, we we wanted to keep we wanted to keep that same aesthetic going, you know. Uh, maybe you know it was yeah yeah and and uh, and I think it, it was worth it for us to do that at least in as much as we could, you know. But we we had a lot of 
lot of recordings that we had to do. It was like a new recording every year. So, were you able to? Bre I mean, that you're all of a sudden, yeah, you've got the Spectres comes out after. What, you, well, you we could pay our bills. Yeah, we yeah, could yeah. pay our bills yeah. for the first time. <laughs> See, people don't understand. People don't understand that. You know, they don't understand that in the, in the formative years for a lot of their favorite rock bands. Even even after the records are out, people don't understand. They just like the music. They think you're all you know driving Porsche nine elevens, um, right, right. Which sometimes is the case, but no, that was the Rush guys. <laughs> See, they only had a three way split, so they got to drive the the nice sports cars. I was still driving a Toyota. <laughs> if if you were going to put together a super group kind of album, I know I'm putting you on the spot, and you we say you can you can hire anybody living living anybody you want who would you want if you were doing like an albert bouchard project thing like alan parsons would do what what, what would you who do you, you like on it i'm just kind of curious okay i would okay super group so it's your people, super group yeah my super group my super group is going to have jet Beck on guitar mm -hmm. probably robert gordon the rockabilly singer would be the singer uh I would have Jordan Rudless on uh, keyboards from uh, Dream Theater. Is that his game? Yeah. Uh, who else would I have? Oh, I, I play rhythm guitar and I have uh, Lars Ulrich on drums. Really? Yeah, that'd be my. Yep. Jeff Beck, Lars Ulrich, Jordan Rudless, Robert Gordon. We'll have more from Buck Dharma coming up in the next few days. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. If you want to help out Rocky Street Music, there's a link at the very top where you can make a donation or join our Patreon. But, you know, subscribe to our channel and like the videos. Share them on social media. We'd appreciate that. I'm John Bowden. This is Rocky Street Music.